Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Well, today, my friends, I'm going to tackle a topic that is very difficult. It's difficult because it's complex, and it's complex because it's the U.S. government's IRS regulations for things. And if you know anything about the IRS regulations, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages long in the IRS regulations on how we all should be taxed. Letting that aside for a second, let's just come back to this assumption. Can you imagine how much more money you would have in your life either to live a better standard of living or to save money for retirement if you didn't pay taxes? Now, think about this. So, well, we have to pay taxes. We all have to pay taxes. We all do? No, some of us don't pay taxes. Why is that? Because in the past, the government has decided that housing is one of the most difficult things in the world to produce. They've tried it. They have built government housing. It's all turned into tenements in just weeks, months, years. It's a complete disaster. They have no way of building and managing housing for people. And it's something that has only survived in the private sector. And it's a risk. For a person to get into a real estate transaction, it's a risk. But if people didn't buy real estate, then there would be no rental real estate out there because the government can't do it. So they've made it a tax-preferenced investment. So if you use these things the government has pointed out it would like you to do, I would like you to do this, and let's give you a tax preference if you do it. Are you breaking the law? No. Are you doing something bad? No. What you're simply doing is following the direction that the U.S. government has told you they would like to see you follow. And so today I'm going to try to discuss with you the many reasons and the many different ways real estate investing is tax preferenced. I suggest that I'm going to bring it down to the lowest common denominator that I can as far as understanding. I'm going to try to stay away from any IRS regulation numbers and technical stuff. I'm just going to tell it to you like just a straight down to earth person. This is what it means. And um, try to walk you through it because it's not only complicated because it's the government and there's all kinds of rules and regulations that go with it, but it's also complicated because there's so many different ways that real estate income is tax preferenced. So let's get started at the very beginning. The one that blew my mind right out of the blocks when I first started doing real estate was the fact that there's some kind of a law out there. I don't know what the number is. In fact, I've got all the laws right in front of me. I'm not going to dig down and pull it out and give it to you because you wouldn't remember it anyway. But the law, one of the laws that got me right away was the fact that by nature, real estate investing income is considered passive income. And so it's just like stock market income. It's passive. It's just like bond income. That's passive and so on and so forth. In other words, you are not materially spending your time doing it. You're not materially active in the business. You just do. You buy a rent house, you put a tenant in there, and voila, you may never deal with it again for a year, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all considered passive income. Now, what is the importance to it being considered passive? Well, do you realize that if you own a business, you pay 15.3% of Social Security and Medicare taxes on every dollar you earn? And if you're an employee for someone who owns a business, they pay half and you pay half. So you pay 7.75 or whatever comes out to half of that. And they pay 7.75 or 7.65 or whatever it is. And do you realize that us real estate investors do not pay that tax on any of our real estate income? So if I make a million dollars a year, I don't pay any Social Security or any Medicare tax at all. doesn't matter because it's passive income. So that in and of itself, if you think about it, is massive. It's massive. But that's only the tip of the spear. When you look into it further, what you find out is they've allowed you to pay no tax at all to get out of income tax. The way they allow you to get out of income tax is they allow you to do some funny math. The funny math is they say that the property is worth 27 and a half years and the land is worth forever. 
So you can take the land value away from the property value and take what's left over, which is the building's value, they call them improvements, and divide that by 27 and a half years. And that's how much they figure that your building is depreciating every year. So you can take that and write that off against your income. And if you've purchased the property correctly, very important, it has to be purchased correctly. There has to be at least 70% debt on the property with no more than 30% down. Then your income will be held back by the debt service to the level where the depreciation will cover the income. And hence, if you have those paper deductions that can be written off against earned income, there you go. It's tax-free. Now, that's really a lot bigger than you think it is. Because you think you're in tax-free income when you think of the fact that you're in your 401k or your IRA. But you're not. That is not really tax-free, and it's not really tax-deferred even. I don't even believe it's considered tax-deferred. They say it is, but it isn't. Because why? Because you didn't get the money. It's gone. It's somewhere else. You never got it. But in real estate income, when that rental income comes in, you have it. It's yours. You can spend it. You can do whatever you want with an investor, whatever you want. Just don't pay the taxes on it yet because you're deferring the taxes off to when you sell it way down the line somewhere. So let's just think about this. We're getting out of paying income tax on money we're receiving. You're not getting out of income tax on money you're not receiving. All you're doing is not receiving your money in your 401k and your IRA. And you think you're getting somewhere. It's real easy. Tell your boss, I don't want to pay taxes on money. And he'll say, I just won't give you any money. And so if you'll live with no money, you'll pay no taxes. That is the genius of the ignorance of the 401k and IRA. Whereas we, on the other hand, we make lots of money. And we bring that money in and pay no income taxes on it because of depreciation and no Social Security or Medicare taxes on it because it's deemed a passive investment. It's not earned income to the point, well, it is earned income, but it's not W-2 income. It's not income produced by your efforts. Now, some idiots that don't know how to run real estate, they really do put a lot of effort into it. They put a lot of work into it because they don't know what they're doing. That's just their ignorance that's doing that. If you do it correctly, you do put time into it, but a very small amount. And the bottom line is whether you put a lot of time into it or you don't put a lot of time into it, the IRS automatically considered it a passive income situation. So if you're out there doing all your own work and painting and fixing and cleaning and doing all this stuff and saving the money of paying somebody else, if you paid that money to somebody else, they would have had to pay taxes on that. But if you keep that money yourself, you don't pay taxes on that income if you have the correctly purchased and leveraged and depreciated piece of real estate. Wow. Think of this. Could it get any better than that? Why, yes, it could. It could get lots better than that. And that's what we're going to cover when we come back in the second segment here. Because there's two other things I'm going to tell you about when you come back you don't want to miss. One of them is the fact, one of them is the fact that you can not only have real estate losses to cover your income from real estate, if done correctly, you can take those real estate losses and cover your earned income with them. Hence, reducing your taxable income from your earnings. And the second one is that instead of selling the property and obtaining and earning the income and being taxed on the income by sale, you can avoid the sale altogether by doing something called a 1031 tax-free exchange. These are two very, very powerful tools, and we'll cover them when we get back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're talking about the tax benefits of owning rental real estate. And in the first segment, we covered the fact that, number one, unlike your 401k and your IRA, you can earn the income and receive the income and pay no taxes on it. Unlike your 401k and IRA income, in your 401k and IRA income, you have already paid Social Security and Medicare on that money before you stick it into your 401k or your IRA. So you're getting taxed both Social Security, Medicare, and you're not paying the income taxes at that time, but you're not receiving the money. 
So what's even worse, the absolute worst possible scenario is to get paid money, to not get it, and to pay taxes on it even though you didn't get it. That's just dumb as a rock, folks. Think to yourself, how stupid am I? I'm allowing them to talk me into doing something this dumb. Dell, earn a dollar, pay 15% income taxes on that dollar, now put the whole dollar back in your 401k and don't get it. Pay taxes on money you don't get. That tax, that money you earn, drives you into a higher income bracket, which means you pay higher percentage of income taxes, and yet you don't get the money. That's about as dumb as a rock, as a dumb rock. That's the 401k is stupid. So we go over here to real estate. You earn the money. You get to keep the money. You don't pay Social Security and Medicare taxes on it because it's passive income. And if done correctly, you use depreciation to cover the income taxes so that you don't lose money. But wait. There's more. There is a way that you can take the excess real estate losses. Now, let me clear something with you right away. Because you're saying, I don't know that I want to be an investment that has losses. These are paper losses. Let's say I make $100,000 a year in rental income, but I have $150,000 a year in depreciation losses. 100000 of those depreciation losses covers that $100,000 of income. So I pay no taxes on that income. But now I have an excess $50,000 worth of paper losses. I didn't really lose any money. I made 100000 bucks. I got paid 100000 bucks. But I've got this excess loss of $50,000. Wouldn't it be nice if I could write that off against my earned income? Well, for years you could. But back in 86, when uh, I guess it was Ronald Reagan changed the tax law, they decided to take that out. So people that earn more than $100,000 a year cannot take those losses. You can take them. If you don't make up to $100,000, you can take them up to $25,000 a year of those losses against your earned income. But you can't take more than twenty five, dollars and you can't take any if you make more than $100,000 a year. $100,000 to $150,000, it phases out. So you can, if you are a real estate professional, though, take all of it. Now, what does being a real estate professional basically say? It says, even though we are going to determine that being a real estate investor is a passive income experience no matter what, if you actually work in your business of real estate, we're going to let you claim that you're actively involved and that your active losses can go against your active income of all types. So that means your W-2 income, your stock market income, your savings income, bond income, all of it. You can take that $50,000 of excess paper losses and write it off on all other forms of earned income. Now that, my friends, is just monstrous. It's unbelievable. It is the type of thing that should make all of you real estate investors. Now, how do you get to be a real estate professional? That's a little tougher, guys. There are two bars you have to pass, and you have to pass them, actually be able to prove you pass them. The first one is at least 50% of your time invested in labor is going to your real estate business. Your real estate business. Now, let me define what a real estate business is. A real estate business is something that materially deals with real estate investing, purchasing, construction, development, and or rental and management operations. So being an attorney that is a real estate attorney is not a real estate professional because his time is not spent directly and materially invested in real estate investing. And neither is a CPA who does a lot of tax returns for people or companies, works for a company that's a real estate company, he CPA is not materially invested in the time of managing and operating real estate. So they're not real estate professionals. Now, there is an area that is interesting that has been argued a few times in tax law, and that's being a real estate agent or broker, because brokering real estate is considered active real estate trade, but then they get down to whether or not they can be claimed that or not, because a real estate agent doesn't have a broker's license. A real estate agent brokers real estate, but they don't have a broker's license. They have a real estate agent license. And so that has been argued. At this point, what I read today was that agents have been deemed to be capable of considering their hours in real estate brokering as part of their hours as in real estate investing. And different types of these things can be added together as long as you have material amounts of them. And the material amounts, I think, is you have to work at least 500 hours a year in any one of them you're going to claim. Otherwise, I don't think you can add it together. I don't know if that's true or not, because this is where it gets so complicated. I don't know if even a CPA knows it. So the next point is 
at least 50% of your hours is in real estate. And the second one is you work at least 750 hours a year on your real estate in material participation with your real estate is the way they say it. What does that mean? Well, I had a lot of people say, well, I have two jobs. I have a little part-time job over here and I have another job over here and I have real estate. Can I claim being a real estate professional? I said, well, you go back to the question. Number one is 50% of your time. And I would also say, argue 50% of your income. Let's say you work a part-time job and you bring in $100,000 a year in a part-time job. It's a good gig. And then the other half of your time is spent on real estate investing, but you only make like $2,000 a year in your real estate. I find that hard to believe that 50% of your time was spent on earning $2,000 and 50% was earned $100,000. But it comes down to, can you materially prove that 50% of your time was spent doing one of the deals that were considered materially invested in real estate? The second one is, did you work 750 hours in real estate? And you're going to have to be able to track that. Now, reverse tracking is not allowed. The IRS has deemed that reverse tracking doesn't work. You can't go back and estimate. You can't take your checkbook and go, then that that day I wrote a check that was doing this that day, and this day I did that, and you know, look at my credit cards and my bills, and I was paying bills that day. You can't go back and do that. You've got to have some type of ongoing tracking system. A little book, mark that every time you're doing something. Now, on this date, from this hour here to this, I did this, and boom. That would suffice. I will tell you that what I would recommend you do on that, because I've done it. (laughs) I've done it for years, is you take that little book, and get yourself a running total. So in other words, I've starting January 1st, I work four hours today. January 2nd, I work one hour. Total five. And just keep the total. Otherwise, you got to go back and count all those different. You know, I worked one hour here. I stopped. I went away. We did this. I came back and went back to work doing something else for three hours. It gets crazy. But otherwise, you got to do that. Or you can't claim real estate professional. We'll be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Today, we're talking about why real estate income is virtually tax-free if done correctly. Now, to be able to make it tax-free, you have to understand that it is, by virtue, first of all, you don't pay Social Security and Medicare taxes. We covered that in the first segment. Second segment, we talked about how depreciation can be used to defer income taxes on the income part of your real estate income and move that forward so you don't pay it and it becomes deferred. And now, how do you get out of the deferral? Well, the next step is something called a 1031 tax-free exchange. Normally, when you'd sell your piece of real estate, all all of the deferred taxes owed would be recaptured, and you'd owe those taxes now, along with whatever additional capital gains you might have made on the value of the property. So, in hence, it would have been like your 401k. It would have been just deferred. But with the 1031, what you can do is you can sell the property and buy another property and roll those deferred taxes into the next property, hence not paying them. We'll say, Dell, don't you eventually have to get out of this to get your money? No. When we do a 1031, we get the money. It just goes into another property. But that property continues to pay us money. So we then can move from one income source to another without paying capital gains tax. So, for example, if you had stocks and you had a real good run on a stock and you wanted to get out of it, you'd sell it and go look for something that had some upside to it. You'd pay taxes on that sale. We're not paying taxes on that sale. If done correctly, we're rolling that tax burden into the next property and continuing to do that. So, well, don't you at some point need to sell it? And here's where it gets really, really crazy. The answer is no. You can defer your taxes until your death. We call it the five D's of tax avoidance. Defer, 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 and die. And when you die, your family inherits your real estate with a stepped-up basis as to whatever it's worth the day that they get it. Meaning, I bought a property for a million dollars. I've deferred taxes on it for 10 years. I now have only, let's say, $750,000 worth of value and $250,000 worth of deferred taxes. My family inherits it. The $250,000 worth of deferred taxes disappears. It's gone. They don't have to pay it. The capital gains from $1 million to $2 million disappears. They don't have to pay it. And they obtain the property at a $2 million tax base. What do they do? They start depreciating all over again, start earning tax-free income immediately and forever, if done correctly. So how do you beat that? I mean, you think about that. That is virtually tax-free. Now, it's not tax-free. It's virtually tax-free, meaning if done correctly, you could avoid taxes 
even into second, third, and fourth generations, if done correctly. Now, that almost never happens because somewhere along the line, somebody wants all the cash out of the property and they sell it and they pay the taxes. That's just the way it happens. And so be it. I've sold many properties where I was in partnerships and we didn't want a 1031 together. We wanted to get our money out and go our separate ways. So we sold the property and paid the taxes. But the beauty of that is the taxes are much less. On my earned income side of my portfolio, where I work in a business or on a business, because I don't really work in a business anymore, but on a business, I'm paying somewhere around 42% taxes. That's my tax bracket. And on real estate, if you have capital gains, it's only like 25%. At one point, it was down to as low as 18%. And recaptured depreciation. Now, remember, if I didn't take this depreciation, I'd be paying 42% taxes on my income. But when I recapture it, if I recapture it, I'm paying 25% on it. So it reduces the amount that you pay on it down to a lower amount if you're in the high tax bracket. Now, if you're in the lower tax bracket, it doesn't really make any difference. It's not going to lower it for you. So there you go. Think about it. Look at all that in perspective and just think about where you would be. If you're right now working, make $100,000 a year, you are taking home about $60,000 a year. So I was making uh, $70,000 a year when I retired. Seventy grand a year, I was only taking home. It was a very small amount because I was only taking home about $3,500 a month. So I'm going to get a calculator out here and say, okay, let's take seventy grand divided by 12 months, and we're talking about uh, $5,800 a month. But by the time they took taxes out, let's say, let's take 33% income taxes and seven and a half Social Security and Medicare taxes, that's 40%. So I got to keep 60% of that times 0. 0.6. I was taking home exactly $3,500 a month. $3,500 a month out of a $70,000 a year paycheck. All I needed to do to replace that $3,500. Because with my real estate income, I didn't pay taxes on it. So all I had to replace was $3,500. And I was in the exact same position I was in before. That's the power of not paying income taxes, social security taxes, Medicare taxes, all of that stuff. It's massive. Now, I'm not against paying taxes. I tell people all the time, I say, you know, how many of you think you paid too much in taxes? And they raise their hands. I said, how many of you paid $400,000 in taxes last year? Nobody raised their hand. I said, well, I did. I make a heck of a lot of money on my businesses, and so I pay taxes. I don't mind one bit paying those taxes. Not even the fact that Obama made it go from 41 to 42, and this guy, whatever his name is now, probably make it go up even more. But I don't even care because I live affluently. But on the part of my income where the government has said, we don't want you to pay taxes on this income, then by God, I'm not going to pay taxes on it either. And that's the way you should feel about it. If they want your money invested someplace they want it, they're going to make it beneficial for you to put your money there. If they wanted your money in a 401k, they would benefit it. Well, they did. They're not charging you income taxes on the money. When you earned it, they're letting you pay the taxes on it. When you get it, that's a bit of a deferral. They want you to put money in 401k. They want you to save for retirement. But in real estate, they want you to live off of the money. That's why they're letting you have it and not pay taxes on it. You have to understand the government sets this stuff up because why? Because of what they have as priorities. Now, I've heard people say for 30 years since I've been going to seminars, listen to other people's seminars, that, well, you know why they won't ever change this is because everybody in Congress owns real estate. That's not true. It's not true at all. May have been way, way, way back in the beginning when this whole thing was set up. They might have all been landowners and they felt like uh, there should be some benefit for landowners. But now most people are just college graduates. Almost everybody in the Congress is an attorney and probably almost none of them own any real estate other than their homes. And they've just defeated the ability to deduct your home. You can't take standard deduction more than, I think, $20,000 now, which is nothing on a home like mine. My personal property taxes, I think, are 60000 bucks a year just on my house. So it's irrelevant as far as a write-off goes. But man, my rental real estate, that's really a good tax deferral. And I call it a deferral for me because I don't really try to avoid it into my next life. I'm not trying to defer it past my life. That's not really my game. It's just I'm not paying it now. And so to me, it's a deferral. Either way you look at it, though, you want to retire. You want to be able to retire. You need to replace the money you live on, not the money you earn, but the money you live on. And the best way to do that, my friend, the very best way to do that is to buy rental real estate. Rental real estate produces passive streams of untaxed income. And I say untaxed yet deferred, but passive streams of deferred taxable income. But you get the money today. You can live on it. What do you need to live? You need regular reoccurring income. Does the stock market provide that? No, they may go up, may go down, but it doesn't give you a check every month. You don't get a check in the mail. Does a bond do that? Yeah, it's earning about 1% right now. Does a CD do that? Yeah, it's earning about 1% right now. 
Are either of those tax deferred or tax free? Yes and no. Really no, except for government bonds, and I think government bonds are tax-free, but they earn like a half a percent or something. Some government bonds are tax-free, but the interest they earn is not worth the time of day to, to buy them, in my belief. So here we go. Do you want to retire? Say yes. Or do you want to just know that you're financially free enough to retire if you want to? Say yes. you want to go to work every day and not have your boss threaten you with your job? Say yes. You want to have additional income on the side that makes the standard of living you live a lot greater? Say yes. We'll be right back with the Del Wongsley Radio Show. Here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Today we're talking about why real estate income is virtually tax-free. Let's talk now about what you should be doing. How do you get started in this stuff? I think it's important for you to think about the steps that are necessary. Here's what I would do. First of all, if you think you're just slightly interested in this stuff, go online, look me up, find my podcasts, and listen to as many podcasts in a row as you can until it starts to sink in. If you're closer, if you really say, hmm, I get it, I get what this is about, I'm ready to take some action, then get signed up for one of our two-day classes. There's all kinds of specials going on all the time. You just go online, look for the special, or contact somebody, ask what specials we got running. But, uh, you know, go online and look for that and get the two-day special. Now, we have it available nowadays because of COVID in two different forms. We used to do live classes Saturday and Sunday, two full days, and just hound you with information. It was like drinking out of a fire hose, I was told many times. There are people that want to get their information that way. They don't want to take a long time. They want to get it, know it, get it done, and take action on it. That's two-day class. But we also found that a lot of people couldn't take off two full days. And so during the COVID, we experimented with a four-day version. It's broken up into four pieces. And some people that liked that said it was more digestible. They could take better notes. They could do it at home. And by the way, the two-day can be taken at home also. So we have it online, the two-day and or the four-day. And I'd get in there and take these classes because what they'll do is they'll give you a foundation of all this stuff that I'm drawing on pieces and parts of throughout these radio shows and show you how it all works and show you a plan to tie it all together to make it make sense. Once you have that plan, you're going to come out of there with so many ahas. You're going, oh my God. First of all, I just didn't know that. Why don't they teach this stuff in school? And they don't. Secondly, I've heard people say taxes and tenants and toilets my whole life, and gosh, how bad real estate is. And then you find out that that's not the way to do it, that people have been doing it wrong forever. And I was lucky enough to find somebody to teach me to do it the right way right from the beginning. And I modeled successful real estate investors that worked. And you can follow that model. I extended that model. I turned it into what was really, for the first time ever, a true business model where people were taking real estate as being like what grandma and grandpa did. They had a little red house, and they'd go over there and paint it and slop it together, and then they'd tear it up, and then they were upset, and then it was this and it was that, and then they just decided to you know, give it to the kids. It was just terrible. That's not what we do. We have a very methodical plan. Next thing you're going to learn is you're going to learn about financing. And you go, man, I can't afford to buy a house. Go, well, maybe you can if you do it the right way. And maybe you can't. Maybe you don't have any money at all. But if you now understand the process for becoming wealthy and you see it, it's laid out there in a map for you. Take a spreadsheet and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, boom. If you see that, you might then go, you know what? I've been spending an awful lot of money on booze, going out to eat and partying, too expensive a car, too expensive a house. Maybe it's worth Cutting back a little bit to build some retirement, to build some extra income. Tell you a side note, I purchased, and I've told this story countless times in the last three months. Starting last year, I started putting contracts on properties. I wanted to buy more because of COVID. And I bought five more properties, two of which I've closed on, three more I'm waiting to close on. Each one of them adds about 10000 9100 8700 you know, Right around ten thousand bucks a piece, all told. With these five new properties, I'm going to have roughly fifty-five thousand dollars a month in income, additional income. Now think about this: I already make a lot of money, 
but I just decided I wanted more money. I wanted more investments. I wanted more tax write-offs. So I just bought five more properties. And now I make 55000 more. How many people out there would love to make 55000 at all? Or even 10000 So buy one property and make 10000 I just happened to buy five. And, you know, and I got to the end of five and I go, you know, I need to stop. I'm getting carried away. It was getting to be too much fun every time I write a property offer and get it under contract. And I got a little spreadsheet here and I'm adding these things together. I'm going, and I have all my other businesses all added up and they're all there. All of my savings accounts are there and everything's on spreadsheet after spreadsheet. They all blend into each other and come to the final dollar amount each day, week, month, whatever it's actually each month and each month into each year and each type of investment down into a total. And then those totals into the other total of all the total. And it's a beautiful thing for type B personality to see a spreadsheet this neat. But what's neat is it's a toy. It's like the game of Monopoly. Every time the year goes round, it's like going around the board one more year and collecting another million dollars and buying more real estate with it. That's my life. Now, when I was a kid, I played Monopoly by myself. Literally, I had no friends because I was 200 pounds in fourth grade, but fat as can be with Coke bottle glasses and no one talked to me in a flat top air cut. So I'd sit in my room and I'd play all four sides of the Monopoly board. I had a different game for each side. One guy bought everything to buy. One guy bought all the railroads. One guy bought all the utilities. One guy bought nothing, just went cash. At the end of the game, every single time for the first 15 years of my life, the guy who bought all the properties won the game. My friends, it's time to start winning the game. It's not just for some money. It's for an incredible life now. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.